Well, hello everyone. Welcome on to our conversation with the very legendary Donna Hill. She's going to be joining us this what is it, this afternoon now. So the day is moving along. We just finished a really, really great conversation with Harlequin panel of editors, um, as well as Sheree Robbins. And we have some master classes going on right now. So if you are a gold and silver pass holder, that's probably where you are. Uh, but if you're catching this replay, uh, we have uh, now coming to our virtual stage. It's Miss Donna Hill. She's a living living legend, first of all, guys. I think I met Miss Donna some years ago at one of these book events. I don't quite remember, um, but she's always been a pleasure to talk to. She's always been consistent with her writing. Um, she's has about one hundred books. I'm probably underestimating, but it is probably about like one hundred or something like that. Um, but Donna Hill, she is a living legend. And this conversation is going to focus on how she mastered um, her creative journey, because a lot of us really want to kind of be in the same space. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring in this legend, Ms. Donna Hill. Hi, Donna. Hi, hi, hi. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm really, really, really good. Like, it's it's so amazing to talk to you, because first, we haven't talked in a long time. I know. Um, a very long time. And then we probably haven't even seen each other in just as long. Um, but you, you know, COVID is totally different. So everything is really digital now. So I'm able to really engage and talk to people that I normally wouldn't be able to talk to these days. So it's really, really good to see you. You're like you have not aged a bit. You know, they say black down crack. <laughs> like you think you look exactly the same, aging very beautifully, my lady. And you are a living legend. I want you to wear that on your shoulders. A lot of people reference you when it comes to the careers they want to master, uh, especially in the romance area. So I'm really eager to talk about how you kind of got there. So it's just, we're just going to talk about you. So this should be easy, right? Okay. <laughs> it's really easy. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to find out a little bit more about Donna. Um, because before that, I don't, I don't technically, you know, be Googling and searching y'all. When I see y'all, you know, we talk, we converse and, but I never really kind of dug a deeper into like your, your beginnings. And so 1987 is when Wikipedia states that you started your career. Ooh. And so, well, you know, I'm, you it when, you, when you wind up on Wikipedia, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I was like, oh, wow, that is really like that's legendary to be consistently putting out stories. Um, and now you have found a place here with Defina. And this conversation is powered by Defina, who is one of our supporters and sponsors this year. So, Donna, take us into 1987 or before that. Like, let, let, like how did she get started? How much time you got? Um, right. <laughs> in 1987, um, I just, well, I was always like writing kind of, you know, like I was doing poetry when I was a teenager because it was like, you know, teenagers always have some kind of angst. So yeah. I was writing you know, sad stories and blah, blah, blah. And I used to write um, love letters for my girlfriends at school to give to their boyfriends. And I would like string song titles together to make these letters. Okay. So that was like back in grammar school. And so like, I always had the, um, this desire to write. So I was always writing. And, and this is a, this is a true, true story. I went to my kids a little, I went to church one Sunday and, um, I said, you know, just tell me what to do with this thing that I love to okay. do. I came home that same afternoon and I started writing this story. And so, you know, back in 1987, there wasn't no computers and cell phones. No, just a typewriter. I had a selectric typewriter top. <laughs> okay. And you know, this is before whiteout too. So you couldn't even white it out. So I had carbon paper, I had all kinds of foolishness. So, um, and it was the little string that was on the typewriter, the white thing that you had to like back up to like get the words correct. Yeah, I remember so, that. Yeah, <laughs> so that was so you old too. Um, so, um, so I typed out this story and then I'm like, okay, I'm all excited. Now what do I do with this story, right? So um, I went to um, this bookstore and I went to the, the how-to section and I, you know, I found the writer's market, this big, okay. 
um, that listed all of the publishers mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I went, I said, well, you know, I definitely don't have a novel. I think the, the book, the, the story was maybe 12 pages. And um, I found Sterling Magazines. So they okay. did all of the true confessions. I said, well, my thing is a short story, so maybe I'll send it there. Okay. So I sent it all to um, Black Romance Magazine. And so I'm waiting, waiting. A few weeks later, I get an envelope back and I was like, oh man, they done sent back my story. <laughs> and across the top of the letters, it was like, this is not a rejection. And this is what I want you to do to fix this story and send it back to me. I was like, whoa. So first of all, this is just a, this is a, a lesson that I learned. Read the instructions because it's clearly this was a confession magazine. The stories are supposed to be confessions and true stories. I had written mine in third person and you know, doing all the, didn't pay no attention to none of that. So pay attention to the directions. So okay. I had to rewrite the story in first person. Okay. Back and they published it. So I was like, whoa, I think they must have paid me like either 50 or 75 dollars. So I was now okay. a honey. So I was like, oh, I could do this. You know, this would be my little side hustle. So I'm writing out these little stories. And um, it was Nathasia Brooks Harris, who was the editor. And um, I was working at a, um, a, a residence for teen moms at that time. She said, you know, you have a lot of experience. Um, why don't you think about being our, um, our relationship writer, right? So women would write in. About all they okay. You were was was there. Like, you were the, the black Terry Bradshaw. Yes, I sh- yes. Before that's the- pretty cool. Yes, that's I sure daggone was now that I think about it. Um, so I started writing um, you know, at the advice I was the advice columnist. So um I was doing all these letters, and what it taught me was one, you can't publish what they send in originally because right. it's because. So I had to learn how to edit. I had to learn how to figure out what was relevant to what they were talking about um, and then put these letters together and then respond. So I did that for a while. And then Nathasia was saying, you know, your short stories are getting too long for our magazine. Um, mm. and we about, Why don't you think about writing a book? So now my stories maybe were like, 16 pages so i'm like okay from 16 pages to a novel and she was like really really supportive and um you know just there for me she took me to my very first writers conference in manhattan and this was like in 1989. okay i had written the story based on an architect and an interior designer i went and i had a meeting with an editor um who had read it and she said, oh, um, you know, it's a good story, blah, blah, blah. But do your characters have to be black? Oh, wow. Like, were you black? So why would they not be black? Exactly. And like one of the first things I learned from all my how-to books was like, you know, like kind of write about what you know, at least when you first start now, right? Anyhow, I was like, well, Kind of, yeah. So she says, well, you know, I'm not telling you, you know, to change it or anything, but if you decide to, we'll be happy to look at it again. What? So this was 1989 okay. in Midtown Manhattan. Wasn't the deep south, you know, back and in the home. No, this was present day for all intents and purposes. So I was totally disappointed. And, you know, just as an aside, the editor was from one of the biggest romance publishing companies like in the world so i'll just put a pin in that right there um so i i i continue to look continue to look eventually i found an ad for odyssey books and it was in the back of one of the writers magazines and odyssey books was a small black publishing company in silver springs maryland okay um they wanted romances written by black folks about black folks. So okay. like, oh, that's me. So I sent my story off. And you know, I was a fabricator at that time. I was like making up stuff. So I was like, you know, here's my story and it's done and blah blah blah. I have really not finished the book. 
Okay. I get a letter back saying, oh, we really want to publish your work. Can you send the rest? Well, I didn't have the rest. So oh. I, oh, so we in trouble now. You really freaked out on this whole journey. I'm loving this. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm going back and forth to work every day. And I got my notebook out on the train, on the New York City subway, finishing my book. In the morning, I'm writing. Yeah. At night, I'm typing. In the morning, I'm writing. At night, I'm typing on my typewriter when I get home. Finished the book, sent it off. That was Rooms of the Heart. And Rooms of the Heart was my very first novel. It was the Rooms first the book heart. that Odyssey Books published. And that came out in 1990. And I've been published every single solitary year since. So let's, so let's stay in this space. Because this is good. This is really good. OK, so I identified some things that you did. I was paying attention. Um, unknowingly, you walked into your purpose. Like this became something that you basically walked into without intentionally doing it. So that's a blessing in itself. Um, then you found people or people encouraged you, um, you know, to do a little bit more. Okay, you did this. Let's, let's try a little bit more. Let's Let's add a little bit more to this. And so along with that, you took on these challenges and, you know, you submitted this and you submitted that with no expectations, just doing it. And then when you got the opportunity to get a, a publishing deal, you met the challenge and made sure that you provided a manuscript. Love it. Um, and this is in 1989. So take us into, let's stay in this space in this year. Where is that book now? That book celebrated its 30th anniversary um, this June, this past June. So um, I've been published for like 30 years. I celebrated my 30th anniversary as a public this year. Well, happy anniversary. Um, oh, thank you. Are we um, able to still purchase that book, by the way? You can get it on, um, I actually digitized it. So you can actually purchase okay. it on Amazon. Um, okay. Through the KDP thing or whatever, yeah. You can yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, because after um, Rooms of the Heart came out, I, I, I published one more book with them, Indiscretions. And then um, in 1983, about um, Kensington decided that they wanted to create Arabesque. And um, Odyssey was having a lot of difficulty at that time because when I first started, just to kind of like backtrack a little bit, when Rooms of the Heart came out in 1990, there had been probably less than a half dozen Black romances that had ever been published, like period, like ever, anywhere, period. Um, so when the book came out, bookstores, one, the big bookstores, didn't want to take it because it's like, who are these Black people? Black people don't read and they definitely don't read this. We didn't have a distributor. Um, so my 10,000 copies of books were sitting in a warehouse in Maryland. Oh, wow. Um, so I started making a list of like all of the Black bookstores like in New York that I could like get to basically. And okay. I started visiting them with my little book in my hand, like, you know, do you want to take this book and like put it on your shelf and, you know, maybe do it on consignment and I'll come back in another month and see how it's doing. So I was kind of almost like a self-published author at that point because I was selling the book like out of oh, my home. Um, yeah. And then we eventually um, nailed down a distributor, Lashina Books um, sort of picked up the distribution. Um, and then we were able to actually get the books into bookstores because there was no place for it. And the bookstores weren't really weren't interested. Um, and back then, you have to remember that there was no section for us. Like, mm -hmm. you know, going to bookstores, it's like, oh, here's the black section or here's the Spanish section. It didn't exist. Um, so we were just mixed in with everybody else or we just weren't on the shelves? We weren't on the shelves, period, because they weren't, the books weren't there. Um, oh. So that was the this first. is the 90s. Yeah, this is the 90s. So, you know, it's not that. OK. Long. Um, so the books were not there. And then once once Arabesque, you know, started pushing these books out more and more and more, then it became a thing. Well, OK, if we're romance and romance readers read romance and they go to the romance section, why aren't our black books 
in the romance section with all the other romances. So then that became not only a, a, an internal battle, but an industry battle as well, because our books, well, I went into a bookstore, it was the, it was the um, I think it was Borders, um, over by the World Trade Center before um, we had the 9-11. And instead of the um, romances being with the romance section, the romances were in, uh, the, the black romances that they had were up against the wall, in a corner, behind a, um, a, a ladder, mixed in with everything that could possibly be black, right? So you just mixed in there. Um, and so that was what we were kind of like up against. Like if we have romance readers, where, how are they gonna find our work? Um, why can't we be, why must we be segregated from the genre in which we write? So that was a battle. And then it, then it became, you know, well, you know, black folks need to find their own books. And so then it became this black section, you know, so then you, you still get set, you get put over there. And, um, so this went on for a really, really long time. And it wasn't really until maybe three, four years ago, um, at the earliest, that um, our black romances were once again um, merged with the romance section and alphabetized, just like everybody else. Mm. So, um, so it's it's been a it's been a struggle. So you know, when people go into stores and they see whatever it is that they see, believe me, it wasn't always that way. Um, so and it's been that way for a while. And 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 quite as it's kept, you know, black romance writers kind of led the way with that. Um, you know, because of the struggles that we had, because this was a genre that Black writers were writing in at a, at a higher pace. Um, so that helped, that helped a lot as well. Um, so that's that, kind of like the early day struggle. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, it's a really amazing hearing um, these early struggles, because when I came in in 2008, when I came into the book industry in 2008, um, I was aware of maybe 50 or so writers. You were probably amongst those. And we're talking about like Eric Jerome Dickey, Mary, B., uh, Mary Morrison, Mary Monroe. Um, Zane was, you know, she's been in a several years at that point. And so whoever was in essence, whoever was in Black Expressions, that's who I knew. Mm -hmm. And then when I came in, I was just, I was 20, very green. Um, and then had no idea about self-publishing, and it was on the rise at that in that moment in the, in the late 2000s. So like a lot more people were beginning to self-publish, and so when I discovered um, all of these other writers, that became the focus of WNBC is to amplify those writers' voices in their books. So it became a wave and wave and wave and wave of so many. Black writers over the years and so many more book clubs became. And, and it, now it, it it really just grew. It grew into something that I guess people would have never imagined because now there are thousands of published Black writers. Yeah. Um, and there are also, there also have been dozens upon dozens of Black-owned publishing houses as well. And so I want to talk about your experience uh, with seeing the, you know, the evolution of Black fiction, um, you know, come into fruition. And not only that, now we're getting on, you know, the big screen, the small screen. And I want to talk about that as well. You have like so many books. So when we going to start, you know, seeing some of your movies and stuff, what are we doing? Oh, I have been down that road already. Um, okay. <laughs> so three of my books were made into movies for TV. Um, so that happened when um, our new... Um, overseers <laughs> bought us from Arabesque and took us over to BET. So when BET came over, you know, BET books, yeah. So, um, so we went over to the other plantation, and so we worked for them. Oh God! <laughs> and, and when we got there, you know, their thing was that they really wanted this product because it was a treasure trove of television opportunities. Um, the thing, the problem was, is that their vision for what our books were and what they were going to be on TV were in completely different things. 
we had a very hardcore base of readers, right? They okay. expressed certain things. They wanted the romance. They wanted the drama. They wanted these wonderful men and these wonderful women. And what BET wanted was something that was going to entertain their audience on a Friday night. And during that, and back then, especially then, their audience was young. Um, it was like, you know, music videos, music videos, music videos, music videos. So now we need to, we want to, we want the same audience, but we're going to give them something that they're not used to. So what a lot of the books turns into were like chases and, you know, murders and all kinds of craziness that had nothing to do with what the stories were about. So, um, you know, they did, they did a slate of 10. So they did three of mine. They did um, they did a bunch of people. They did Francis Ray. Um, yes, the, the the other literary legend, Mr. Yes, Francis they, Ray. They did, they, did, they did a bunch of them. Um, so they did ten in total, um, and th the readers were so up in arms about what had happened to their books and their characters that that came to sort of like a grinding halt. Um, but even though the experience was difficult to get through, to say the least, I can say it's on my resume. Yeah, three of my Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, it's so unfortunate. Because I, I always wonder what happened to somebody say, oh, I remember those movies on Friday. I actually own a lot of those movies and stuff on DVD. Um, I remember in... Um, what was it, Blackstone? That was they were putting out some movies and stuff around that time. I don't know BBC Books was adapting some of their um, their books, and I remember this one day BBC Books being here, and then one day it was just gone. And I was like, "Well, dang, that was a black book line." You know, I was I remember saying that to myself. Um, like you, you've had so many different experiences, and again, so you stated you had your some of your books turned to TV films. Um, Thirty years in now, why do you feel that you're you're able to still consistently publish and write? Hmm. Well, I think that um, over the course of the time that I've been writing, um, the, the, the base that I have, you know, the readers that read me have, they know what they're going to get, right? Right. Um, and then I think also too, I haven't always stayed specifically in one lane. Um, like I started out doing romances, but I was always a mystery and espionage reader before I began a romance, before I started writing romances. And um, it gave me an opportunity to do other types of things. Um, I've done a ton of like women's fiction novels, like all of my hardcover work came out of St. Martin's. Um, and, and I had the opportunity mm. to do that. Um, I've written mysteries, I've written erotica, I've written paranormal. Um, so I have an opportunity to do different things. Um, I've gotten other writers together to put together projects. Um, mm -hmm. So I've done that as well. So, I, you know, I what I, what I look when I look at writing, um, I look at it as what other ways can I parlay the skills that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I've taken all that you know I've learned and experienced into the classroom. So I've been you know an English professor for the past whatever it is seven years. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of it is being true to yourself. And, and, and you know, a lot of times, you know, people ask you, like, you know, well, how do you be, you know, what's success for you? What's success yeah. for you? Whatever you make it, you know, like, if, you're, if your thing about success is, you know, I got to make this list, or I have to do this, or I have to do that, or if I, you know, if I'm not recognized by so-and-so, then I'm not really um, successful. Um, to me, that's not success. Um, it's sort of like chasing after something. If it comes from me, then it's great. If it doesn't, you know, I see, you know, sometimes I, you know, I'll be honest, I'll sit back and I'll look and I'll see the stream of, you know, 
writers that, you know, just skyrocket to fame. And I was, I'm like, wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and if, but if I took that to heart and said, well, you know, I've been around 30 years and how come I don't have, <laughs> I would be angry like, oh, God. Um, I can imagine. And so, so that's not my thing. It's like, okay, let me, you know, I'm going to do what I do. You know, I enjoy certain things. I enjoy writing about certain topics, whatever um, issues in life are interesting to me. Um, I find a way to try to incorporate it into my work. Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's me. <laughs> just regular. I love, I love the, the free spirit and just the easy breezy and what's for me is for me. Um, I love that energy it does definitely keep you sane, keep you level, keep you humbled. Let's talk about in your, your current journey. You're, you're now uh, found a home with the FINA. And Dafina is celebrating 20 years of publishing Black stories, amplifying Black writers and their stories. So take us into your, your current experience. Hopefully it's not like BZ Books. <laughs> no, I can't say that. Um, I'm not, no, I'm not going to disparage them. They did a lot for us. Probably, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. But anyway, um, so I've actually been with Dafina since Dafina started. My very first um, novel with them was If I Could. Um, Karen Thomas was my editor. Um, and we, you know, we were sitting around trying to, at, at the time, thinking of what the name of the book thing was going to be. Um, so Karen published my first book. Um, I think Kim Roby was there during that time as well. Um, then Mary Monroe, Carl Weber, you know, all of um, Mary Morrison all came through um, Dafina. Um, and it was, a, you know, it was a really great experience. And then, you know, I worked with, um, Selena. Um, and so I generally publish with Dafina, usually like a book a year. And okay. those, those are my, um, my sort of standalone women's fiction titles. And I usually publish, um, a novella, for the holidays, if it's you know Mother's Day or Christmas or whatever, so I'm usually in those anthologies as well. Um, sometimes they have special. We're gonna do some special summer thing. Um, so I've been with Tafina since they began. Also, now that I think about it, yeah. Okay, I, you know what? I'm ha you know I'm a little happy jealous about your journey. It's been, it's been consistent. You've had homes, and not only that, you've been consistent with your writing, your your theme. So you have a a flow and a consistent concept going on with Tafina. You have your holiday and your season stories, which I often see. And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. And I think a lot of people followed that um, after, you know, over the years, after the fact, coming out with their holiday books and, you know, their Christmas stories, all that jazz. Um, any advice for writers who are technically in it? Because um, we know that the easiest thing is obviously to write and put it out. But those that are in it, they want to build longevity in this industry. And they want to, you know, build and, and basically master a creative life such as you. What advice would you give them to kind of maintain that longevity? Well, um, the main thing for me is to, uh, to read, um, to be aware of the world around you. Um, to hone your craft, um, to realize that every story that comes into your head isn't worthy of a novel. Right. And okay. That's not to say anything bad about your story or your family or whatever, but it's not <laughs> worthy of a novel. Um, and really understanding what, because, because what, what, what happens is We'll be gone, right? But our work is representative of us long after we've walked out of the bookstore, you know, set our breath, breathe our last breath. All of those things, our books are going to be there. So what, are the, what is it going to represent when, when, when they look back through your body of work? Um, so you want to write and, 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 and the other thing, too, that I find um, is, is extremely important. Don't write to trends. Mm. Trends come and go. So if you've hitched your wagon to some trend and it stops because people ain't interested no more, 5,000 people that wrote about this same thing, 
what are you going to do? Um, and always think about how you can diversify what it is that you write. Don't be a one note writer. Like what else can you do? How else can you write? How can you um, make your garden grow essentially? Um, and if you're going to write um, in a specific genre, which is great. If you're going to do that, be good at it, okay? Um, and still follow the trend. Um, yeah. how, how, how are you going to make your stories better? Um, is it working to have, you know, uh, sweet romance for somebody who's 40 years old? Um, so you need to be thinking about the market. Um, and, you know, like... So much has changed, you know, from when when I first started. We have so much um, uh, marketing available to us. Right. Um, you know, back when I started, we had to actually write letters. <laughs> 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 yes, and we had to have a PO box because you know our editors <laughs> would say don't have the right, you know, don't have readers know where you live, so they would send yeah letters to the editor. And they would send us, you know, these big envelopes full of, and we'd have to sit down and write letters to people. I um, remember, like the fan letters, fan yeah. mail. Yeah. I forgot all about that. Yeah, so live fan mail. <laughs> like, do people make use the mailbox anymore? Like, do people write letters anymore? Like, that would be nice yes. to write a little fan letter. I, I love getting stuff in the mail, other than bills. You know? <laughs> right. So, I love getting stuff in the mail. But, um, you know, so and, and just be open, um, be willing to grow, um, read constantly, um, be aware of, you know, the world around you, because those are the things that help to influence your writing um, and makes it richer, you know? Ooh, sorry. Some kind of brain and pop up on our window. Um, so take me into uh, your stories now. What stories are you currently creating? Um, well, from um, Dafina, the follow-up to A House Divided just came out in July, which is the other sister. Um, so that's brand spanking new. So if you haven't got it, you should get it. Um, it's called The Other Sister. Like, should I hold it up so y'all can see? See? Ooh. That's uh, so. That's my latest. I love book. that. That's my latest book out of Zafina, and then um, I submitted a book um, that's part of my Grants of DC series um, to Harlequin. Uh, so that should be out probably the beginning of the year. I'm thinking, um, and then in November, I am totally psyched about my um, upcoming novel, Confessions in B Flat. Um, it is a story about um, uh, two characters, one who follows the teachings of Martin Luther King and one who follows the teachings of Malcolm X. They meet um, during the height of the civil rights era. Um, they couldn't be more different. Um, political views from where they came from, one is from New York, one is from the South, and um, all sorts of stuff happens. And I'm really, really excited about that. So that book is coming out in November. And it is, um, it's, 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 it's multi, what do they call it? Um, it's sort of, it's a digital, it's a digital type book because it'll have images in it. There's, if you get the electronic version, there's links in it that'll take you to some of the actual speeches and videos and things like that. So it's a multi, whatever you call it. <laughs> so if you get the paperback version, you'll still see the images and you'll be able to go to your website and you know go to some of the speeches. So, you know, part of Malcolm X's speeches in there. Um, uh, there's newspaper clippings about what happened during the '60s and things like that, and, and uh, you know, archival information. So. Um, but it's a romance. Um, <laughs> on top of all of that, it's a romance, um, and uh, I'm really excited. So, confessions and B flats. So, take a look for that, and definitely pick up a copy of the other sister, which is available now. The other sister, which is available now. 
And so Miss Donna, post COVID, um, what do you plan on doing? Are you going to be going on a book tour? Are you going to be staying in the house, chilling, going on vacation? How is that looking for you? Oh, wow. Well, I have been basically in my house, in my neighborhood since March when school closed um, because then we went to distance learning. So I've been teaching from home. Um, school just actually started yesterday, as a matter of fact, started back up yesterday. Um, so, you know, we're doing all of our classes online. So I'm here. I have probably done, it's funny, now that it's this cold, COVID, got to stay home, can't do this, can't do that. I have probably done more events <laughs> since COVID. Than <laughs> right. Before. Okay. Last year, I don't, I didn't go anywhere, I didn't do anything in particular, you know, just like tweeting and whatever. But this year, like I, I did, um, I'm, I'm going to be doing the, the Brooklyn Book Festival. I'm doing this. Um, I'm doing something for RWA tomorrow. Um, I did um, uh, Max Rodriguez's event in July. Uh, so it's just like all of these different things. It's because, and I did um, Wine and Words uh, for Written Magazine um, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, and, and, and what was great about it, unfortunately, <laughs> of, of us being here, but the, the good part about it is, is that, you know, just like you, I probably wouldn't have been able to get to Atlanta. Right. But I'm here now. Um, and so the same thing with all of these different events that, you know, you may not have been able to go to for a variety of reasons. So now you can be there virtually. And I agree. Traveling virtually, uh, traveling virtually, but being able to do all these things virtually has allowed us to be able to have so many conversations this year for Black Friday weekend that sometimes we wouldn't normally be able to have because the art that has to go here or go there or we can't get everybody to Atlanta. But we will be returning to Atlanta next summer, the second weekend in June. I'm going to be inviting everybody and their mama and their mama's mama because we're about to have the biggest reunion for Black creatives of all time in my Kanye voice. Um, but that, this has been amazing hearing your beginnings, hearing where you currently are. Um, congratulations on the consistency of, of your journey and mastering your creative life. I, I only aspire to be a fraction of you as a writer because I haven't even gotten there, even brushed the surface. Um, but yeah, until we meet again, virtual hugs, thank you so much for joining us and keep writing and thank congratulations you. on everything as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Now, everyone, we do have a conversation with Mary B. Morrison that's up next, which is also supported by Tiffany Books. So if you're ready to check that out on our YouTube channel, um, or if you're in our event, um, make sure that you're following the conversation there. We're going to share those live links with you. I'm going to leave you guys with one of my commercials. Hopefully you're running. And that was you. Our stories, okay. our voice. Our history hasn't always been welcomed, but we learned long ago that if America won't celebrate us, then we will celebrate our own, told our way on our time. Today, we have thousands of black creators in film. Thousands of books are on the shelves of stores around the world, but it wasn't always as easy. For Lena, for Hattie, for James, for Zora, for Langston, we fought for a place in American history and we've empowered our own voices, keeping our stories alive. Remember Philando, remember Mike, Remember Trayvon, remember Sandra, remember Oscar, remember Brianna. No more will black voices go unheard. No more will black stories go unread. We will write our own history and create our own legacies. And each summer in Atlanta, we will gather. We will celebrate, we speak out. Black voices matter. Black stories matter. Black lives matter. Everybody has a story to tell. Make sure that you tell yours. Create your story, dream out loud.